Okay, I think we're recording. Good evening, Jenny. Thank Hi, you. Lisa. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the time to dialogue. Um, I wanted to reach out to you, um, well, to share a few thoughts and ask for your 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 your, your comments and conversation uh, about your journey as a socialist. I'm doing dialogue sessions recently, and it turns out they're all with socialists so far. Um, and, 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 and why not? Um, so on that basis, I thought I'll reach out to you and I was very surprised and pleased that you agreed and thank you for, for giving me your time this evening. Um, the reason I want to talk to you is because you, 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 you've got a, a large span of experience of being a socialist from, from your trade unionism, uh, which is continuing obviously, and your work as general secretary. Um, and also you were general secretary when Jeremy w w was a uh, leader. And that inspired me to join the party for the first time ever, really. I never thought of joining a party until he became leader. So, and also I want to try and demystify um, uh, socialism in the, in, in the general consciousness and, and hopefully bring more people into awareness of that as, as, as I have, um, and I'm on that journey now. So in terms of dialogue, I'd be curious to know what you consider dialogue to be in your work and experience and what that means to you. Well, I guess dialogue is communication, isn't it? And um, it's got to be dynamic. Um, and it's really important that, you know, each side listens to each other and considers the points that um, the other side or the other person says, depending on whether you're, you're talking to a group of people or to individuals. Um, and I guess it's with a view usually to sort of either sharing information or um, helping to educate or enlighten people or alternatively to reach agreements which is obviously something I've done for most of my life um, when negotiating so it covers a, a you know a, a, a wide sort of variety of different forms of communication but it's, it's basically communication. And, and how do you overcome any obstacles that you faced through that dialogue in terms of um, challenges and pushback I mean what, what, what are the approaches how have you overcome them and I mean can you share some reflections on, on that I mean how does it become um, difficult when does it become difficult well it becomes difficult when um, people won't listen to what you're saying and that works both ways you have to hear what the other person's saying and I don't just mean he hear but really take on board and try and understand mm. the other person's viewpoint but it, it depends in what form that that dialogue is so for example as a um, a full-time official of a trade union, I spent 30 years negotiating and that's quite different um, to the kind of dialogue that you might have with somebody who's got a slightly different viewpoint where you're exchanging opinions and views and perhaps trying to win the other person over to your view or maybe learning from the other person. With negotiation, you usually start, um, in my experience anyway, with people who've got quite different agendas and they want very different outcomes because you've got an employer who wants to negotiate a deal that is usually the best for their shareholders and will cost them the least and you've got the trade unions who are trying to get the worst for that the, the most for their members so I, I guess the the key things for me um in any kind of dialogue are to be honest and to be open um but also in particular for negotiations to make sure you're properly prepared and that you you know you you know the person that you're talking to or you know the company that you're talking to that you research their background uh, you know, because then you're able to make far more persuasive arguments, I, I guess. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's a huge variety in the kind of, um, yeah. you know, dialogues that there are. You know, if it's one-to-one, -one, it's one thing. If it's if it's a negotiation, it's quite different. And then you've got sort of quite, I, I guess, quite different approaches in terms of communication when you've got someone like the leader of the Labour Party, for example, who is trying to communicate with an audience that perhaps he or she isn't able to directly engage with because they're you know they're saying things and hoping that their their words will not fall on stony ground and that people will listen to them and understand them yeah. um you still have to kind of you know really i think understand who it is you're talking to who you're reaching out to who you want to to persuade so, so you that's not a very clear answer you know absolutely it's it's vague and, and maybe that's the spontaneity of, of, of being vague really it allows for things that may not be possible to be possible because vagueness doesn't mean you are tied into something that you've got flexibility in some sense. So yeah, and then you need a listening ear. Do, do you think there is, what's dialogue like in the movement right now in, 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 in the socialist movement, in the, in the Labour Party or, or widely in the trade union movement, et cetera? I'll come on to movement shortly, but 
it feels to me that it it's lacking and I'm a lay member I'm a newish member three four years but it feels to me that there doesn't seem to be sufficient dialogue or maybe I'm being naive how do you feel at this point is, is there dialogue across mm. I think it's I think certainly within the the Labour Party things are extremely difficult because there are some very polarized views yeah. and I think there it feels like there's a lot of antagonism and somebody who's you know speaking as someone who's been on the left all my life I feel very unwanted in the in in the party at the moment and I know a lot of people on the left do because there is a sort of general view that that somehow everyone who has anything to do with Jeremy Corbyn whether they supported him whether they worked with him um, or whether they simply liked his ideas are somehow to be forgotten and moved aside mm. um, and I think that you know I, I, I've been a member of the Labour Party since I was 18 so a very very long time 43 years um, and I've seen a lot of different leaders and I, I think all of them have had their merits maybe I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail of any individuals no. Um, but I've never, you know, publicly opposed any any leader. I think everyone's elected by um, the membership, and they're entitled to to lead. But I think that it's foolish if you're not prepared to take on board the views of other people and try and, you know, create some kind of unity mm. of purpose, if you like. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do worry at the moment and I'm, I'm not saying there's one side or another side, by the way, who's right or who's wrong. It just feels there's a lot of antagonism and a lot of a lot of unpleasantness. And perhaps the reason we haven't experienced so much of that in, in, in the past is because maybe social media is, is far, far more um, prominent in our lives than it was before. And I think social media can be absolutely fantastic and a brilliant platform for communicating with people, but it can also be really unpleasant and hateful and difficult to get a viewpoint across um, in 280 characters, you yeah. know, so I, yeah. I've, got, I've got very, very mixed views about Twitter, you know, you, you see people say the most appalling things and think, you know, why on earth can't you just perhaps keep silent on that? Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I think people are less likely to listen to you if you're, if, you know, if you, if you behave like that, if you behave in an antagonistic way all the time, in a hateful way all the time. Indeed, yeah. I think it's fantastic for spreading information, but uh, as I always say, and, and as I've been experienced in my life, it's sharing information is not dialogue, you know, it's just sharing information, uh, moving on. But, uh, uh, yeah, social media doesn't seem ideally equipped for conversation, as it were, um, in, in some shape or form. Asking about the movement, when I joined the party, um, you receive your membership card, it says Democratic Socialism on the back, it, it, it you get you get little in terms of what the structures of, of the party are. I'm sure there's literature on that and I probably didn't read it properly and you start to experience it by meeting members. But one thing that I have come across consistently from day one is the term movement mm -hmm. or the phrase movement. What, what, what is the movement? You know, it, for me, when I hear that, it sounds a spiritual experience. I know that we're in secular society, it's a secular party, which has spiritual roots as it were. But what does movement mean when we say the movement and you know, from a podium or whatever, what are what what is being alluded to, and what is being um, highlighted in, 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 in your experience? I guess when we talk about the labour movement, we talk about the you know the, the combined wings of the of the labour movement, effectively, which are the trade unions and the Labour Party. Um, for some people, it's broader than that. Not everyone who's in the labour movement is a member of the Labour Party, or indeed any political party. Some might be members of other parties or none. Mm. Um, but I, I guess it's in general, and this is incredibly simplistic, it's, it's people who share the same values and visions of, of, of wanting a more equal and fair society. Mm -hmm. um, and especially over recent years where, you know, the uh, um, wealth is concentrated more and more and more in, you know, the, the hands of a, a smaller and smaller number of people. And we're, we're seeing greater poverty, um, you know, a, for far more people, including people who are in work, which is really worrying. But I guess for me, it's also about internationalism as well. Um, and the movement for me has got to include internationalism and peace mm -hmm. um, and, you know, an end to war and things like that. And it sounds incredibly 
you know, I, I guess in some, some, some people might think that's just ridiculously ambitious, but I don't think it is. No, I agree. Um, I guess that's, we, when you come back down to dialogue, that's what, that's what dialogue can, can help to do, can't it? You know, the only way that we can, we can um, deal with the huge issues that face us is to discuss them and try and find a way around. Now, again, that's difficult. I talked earlier on about when you've got people who are on either side of a negotiating table and they've each got their own um, agenda and they, 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 they've got something that they want to protect in particular, mm. you know, with um, people who've, who've got the power at the moment, the, the, the um, powerful who have got, you know, the wealth, they've got the rules, they've got tax havens, um, they've got the media, um, and sometimes it feels that we're, you know, like that cartoon you see of an ant pushing a boulder uphill, that's sometimes what it feels like but I, I think if you're if you're part of the movement you're not on your own are you you're you're working collectively with other people who've got the same views as you and I think that can be tremendously empowering and you mm. can make a difference you can change yeah it, you've always got to have hope yeah it, it, it feels to me it, it, movement means constant well, literally movement but obviously not physically but movement in issues and changing of opinions and policies and so forth that would be called movement but it feels to me, and, and again, as, as an inexperienced socialist, I, I would always have been a socialist of some sort or another, but um, it, it's, it's, it feels stunted, it feels halted, as it were, um, and, and, and the absence of conversation or dialogue and this constant adversarial experience that's going on on the left, or particularly in, 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 in the left wing of the Labour Party or in socialism generally, it feels very demoralizing, as you mentioned earlier, but I'm sticking around. I, I, you know, no, nothing lasts forever, as it were, uh, and hopefully things will change. Um, I, I just want to say, I, I don't feel demoralized at all. Yeah. I, I, I've always got hope and I've always kept hope. And I think that's one of the things that attracted so many people to Jeremy Corbyn is because he offered a vision of hope. Mm. Um, because I think he expressed things in, in such um, a digestible way that people could really kind of listen and understand and think actually do you know what it doesn't make sense all of our utilities you know vital things like water and so on being in the hands of people who make a profit out of them that's a that's the wrong thing you know to do it's completely wrong that you've got people who are working for um, massive tax avoiding companies that are having to claim benefits because they're so poorly paid or yeah. you know they're on zero hours contracts and they can be binned off at any time you know that that sort of thing i think the way in which Jeremy expressed his vision, really did give people hope. And I, and I think, you know, I, our movement is nothing if we haven't got hope. Otherwise, we'd all give up and we're never going to do that. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. You've <laughs> lifted me up uh, from, from, from a slight uh, diversion there. Um, but yes, coming to Jeremy himself a, a little bit, um, you've talked about his, 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 his vision, his, his, his hope he was speaking to, but I, I found it quite remarkable his reach basically in, in terms of not only across the generations um, but also difference of, 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 of occupations that people had he wasn't specifically one demographic or another it seemed to be very in my lay experience it seemed to be very wide-ranging um, I mean it certainly asked me to consider joining a party I mean I came in 2017 to the Labour Party so I was I was not immediately joining but why is that what what was he doing uh, and maybe not him as a person but what him as a person as well as the messages he was conveying what was that what did that create that that spontaneity that people suddenly went from i don't know 150 250,000 membership to 550,000 i think at the point that, that yeah. you know, in 2018 or so maybe more what happened i mean it seems remarkable really well um i think there's a number of different factors um one of the, one of the things which surprised me because i didn't know until he told me but that my dad joined the labor party when he was 89 and he'd never been a member of any political party in his life. And he told me that the reason that he joined the Labour Party was because Jeremy Corbyn was the first honest um, politician he'd ever come across. Um, and I then found, and none of them had told me that every member of my family had joined the Labour Party mm. um, and they'd never been members of any political party before. And I think it's because of you know, what I was talking about just now, but he was talking about very basic common sense ideas um, that people could see were possible. You know, it's it's not it's not impossible, and for us to have a more equal society, it's actually quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible for us to rebuild our economy and rebuild Britain, um, and 
you know, make and create decent jobs for people and, and have, um, you know, people who are have got security and they've got fairness and so on. I think that, that that's the thing. And for young people in particular, um, who have been just abandoned so much over recent, um, certainly the last 10 years, they were really excited by, by what Jeremy had to offer. You know, they'd been forgotten, they'd been left behind. Mm. And, you know, he, he talked about the um, policies that would really give them a place in society, you know, housing um, and end to war, which I think is extremely important, but also talking about a green economy, economy and talking about, you know, climate justice and mm. fairness. We only have to see how massively um, influential Greta Thunberg is, for example, to see, you know, just how much people are yearning for that, I think. And he couldn't have been more different from the usual politician who comes out with the sound, sound bites and the smart suits and, mm. you know, has to make sure that they're completely pre prepared and rehearsed to the nth degree. Jeremy's real strength is his humanity. I think he was able to, to just reach out to people and people really believed and, and understood that he cared about them. And, you know, I was lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time going around in the outside world with Jeremy and he was never too busy to speak to people. And when he did speak to people and have photo opportunities, it wasn't for a photo opportunity. It wasn't for a sound bite. It's because he was genuinely interested mm. in what they had to say. If he met you, he'd be asking, you know, what do you think? You could be asking him something. He'd, he'd bring it back to you. Mm. So it wasn't about Jeremy. It's about the people he was talking to. And I think that that kind of intimacy sort of became almost writ large. So it, it felt very much to hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions of people, that he was talking directly to them mm. and really striking a chord. And I think that was that was absolutely huge. It's, it's yeah. not something that we've seen in, 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 in politics for many, many years. I think the way I summed it up in my own mind, and it's come over the years, is he was, and you've alluded to it just there, he was a discontinuity. You know, he, he wasn't, although he's been an MP and a politician for many years, a campaigner, peace campaigner, um, and, 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 you know, very much interested in dialogue from what I can tell, but he was a discontinuity. He was something that was, yeah, didn't continue in terms of coming as a politician, to, particularly to be the leader of the party, or even to be the campaign that was leading to for him to become the party. Spontaneously, seemed to be just attracting a lot of attention, just for the things he was saying, which seemed to be, as you say, common sense. And it was almost unusual to have that <laughs> so, so 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 straightforwardly said. And the other thing was, um, yeah, I mean, I do want to give respect to Jeremy here because he's so important, and you you've, you've worked with him and you've served with him. It, there was a sense of decency about what, what he, how he did things. And I think in my mind, and, and I have no evidence for it because I'm not a psychologist or anything, but there is a ream or a seam of decency within British consciousness, you know, that, that people want to be decent. That there is, one of the British values you would say is decency. You know, it could be any country's value, but Britain or the UK seems to push that value a bit more further forward, saying this is who we are, we want to be seen as decent. And you see lots of charitable organisations, people giving up their time. And there seems to be an unconscious or, or hidden identity, which is, look, decency. And he ex for me, he seems to have ex exemplified that quite quite straightforwardly, saying this is that decency right in front of you. And that, that was obviously, uh, um, you know, irresistible to a lot of people and mm -hmm. threatening to others, I'm sure. Um, one of the other things he seems to have done is, is, is bring um, the connection between the Labour Party and, 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 and unions more closely, closely together. Am I am I right in saying that, or, or was it always there, or has he just given it more recognition? Because he's uh, yeah. about unions quite a lot, I think. I think. I think. I, I think. I think it's a bit different with Jeremy um, to other leaders because I'm, I'm not saying other leaders haven't supported trade unions, but Jeremy is a trade unionist. So he has been all his life. Mm -hmm. And he really believes um, in the importance of trade unions and in the value of trade unions and um, the fact that you can't divide the trade unions from the Labour Party. You know, we are we are part of that movement. Um, and I really felt that very, very much, um, having been frustrated so many times in the past. There was real dialogue between Jeremy and trade unions. He mm -hmm. really genuinely wants to know, you know, what is it that that you want from us? Um, or what is it that we can do together, rather? I, I, I think it's wrong to say what is it that 
that trade unions wanted from the Labour Party that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. But he really, you know, genuinely had has a complete commitment to organise collective um, working people having a voice. Oh. I think that, you know, really important, and it, and it felt very different. You know, but we often get the, and it, a good example of that is he's all, he he will go out onto picket lines, not to have his photograph taken. He'll just turn up um, in picket lines whenever he's got an opportunity to do so, whenever he's available to do so, to mm. show real solidarity because he he believes passionately in the power of solidarity and solidarity does make a massive difference. If you're on strike, you're standing on a picket line and you've got a big powerful employer who says, we are never going to give in, you know, you can stand out there as long as you like and it's raining and you're cold and you feel fed up. And then you get lots of other people coming along with other banners from other trade unions or politicians like like um, Jeremy or, 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 you know, whoever else it is who's coming along mm -hmm. and saying, you know, we completely support you. Then that makes you feel you know much more empowered to continue the fight um, and to carry on until hopefully you win. I, I, I just wanted to move on a little bit to um, your, your life as, as, as a socialist reader, your, your journey and, and I think when we spoke briefly before I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago we had a, a, just a brief chat before but I didn't get the impression from what you said that it was a career path you know a plan like some people have saying look this is where I'm going to be. This is my objective. But you, can you can you share a bit about your journey as a socialist and how? I know you started as, as, as you know as a ward representative and obviously further along uh, political direction of Unite and then moving on to general secretary. I've, I've taken a lot of leaps there. Obviously, there's lots happened in between. Um, but uh, I'm conscious of time that they, that, you, you, that that we have. But can you share a bit about that? And just before you do that, I wanted to share a little bit a, a closing paragraph of your statement uh, or, your, or, your, or your article in 2018 on International Women's Day where, where you closed with and this seemed to chime with me about your inner spirit as it were of, as a socialist and, and your sort of call to people to join a union and you say and you close with to my fellow women trade unionists keep believing that you can make a difference and your union will help you to achieve your true potential all unions including Unite, offer a huge variety of training, education courses to help our members broaden their skills and play a more active role in their workplace, as well as in the wider political world. The iconic image of Rosie the Riveter sends out a clear message to us all. A woman's place is in her union. I mean, that, 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 that seems like a call to arms really, saying, look, you know, you, you have a place, a union, um, experience of being a union is, is a complete self experience really that you, that, that you could develop yourself you could develop your own life and your own skills etc can you share a bit about your I know we've had we've, I couldn't cover it all in this conversation but can you give us an insight into your journey um, that led you to become general secretary oh goodness um, I, I guess a series oh, of God. accidents probably is <laughs> it's the best way of describing that I mean when I I guess my journey, if you like to call it, that started when um, when I was 18, when I first joined the Labour Party and joined the trade union. Mm. Um, but I'd always had a sense of the importance of fairness and, and social justice. And although I can't, my, my family were not trade unionists and they weren't socialists, far from it. Um, but my, my mother was sort of very involved in the church, not in a preachy way, but in doing a lot of voluntary work and you know doing a lot of things with the homeless homeless people and you know delivering meals on wheels and things like that um and i guess that kind of seeing you know seeing the need for that made me realize that there was a huge amount of unfairness and injustice in society so when i left school um i didn't want to go to university um i really wanted to to work in the movement i don't i don't mean as a as a job or a career necessarily I just wanted to be close to it and be part of it and be active and involved mm -hmm. um, so you know I, I became a, a, a rep and a branch secretary in a company called BOC and then I ended up working for um, the, what was a transport general workers union as a secretary um, and ended up eventually after a, a number of different things becoming a full-time official um, and then worked for the union for many many years and I was always active in the Labour Party, not nearly as active as I would have liked to have been because being a trade union official is 
um, pretty pretty all consuming really you're kind of working seven days a week most of the time mm -hmm. um, but I was um, on the NEC of the Labour Party for Unite I was on there for seven years um, when I became a national official I was a political director for Unite and then when it was it, um, a vacancy came up for the general secretary position in 2018 um, I was encouraged to apply for it um, and I went to meet Jeremy and agreed that I would apply for it and I did and, and I was appointed so I was there for two years so that's a very very quick <laughs> route yeah. through my, how I ended up where I was. <laughs> no that, 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 that was kind of you. Um, would it be fair to say that you and Jeremy as a team, as it were, the leader of the party, the general secretary, having a good collaborative relationship is that you know is is, is critical really um, that, that to share a similar sense of politics, similar sense of direction. That while the leader presents to the public, leads the party, you yeah. are trying to sort of deliver that mechanically, as it were, practically through the organisation. Yeah. So coming to that, I wanted to ask you. Um, the challenges you face doing that and, and before before you share something on that i just wanted to well just put it on the record that somebody's acknowledging you in, in your 2018 address to conference i mean there's there's so much there and then there's also similar in the 2019 but you're covering issues such as um being the second women general secretary obviously at that time uh, and still you talked about sexism and, har and harassment anti-semitism and, and, you, and you gave uh, many uh, items of, 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 of progress and, and attention that you were giving to that from the code of conduct to the Chakrabarti reports, rule changes, and asking for solidarity and, and you know, showing solidarity with Jewish brothers and sisters, um, and, and um, asking members to get involved. And, and, um, and also you talked about Islamophobia and the Windrush generation. Uh, and, 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 and you spoke about very powerfully at the end of that, the neglect of black and minority communities in terms of that when we want their vote we go and talk to them as it were i'm paraphrasing but but and and i thought that was refreshing it was equally as refreshing what jeremy w w was talking about and similarly in, in in the 2019 address to conference which i happened to be there because i was representing the clp at the time and that was an experience and a half um, for another time where you're talking about the privatization you're talking very um uh, powerfully about your own experience of the NHS and how it saved your life and, and you're listing nurses and doctors, healthcare workers, technicians and porters, key workers, the, the, the phrase that we've become uh, accustomed to now. And you also very powerfully address the, the brilliant Labour staff. So you're acknowledging the whole movement there really. So with, with, with those book end speeches, how was it to try and deliver those issues those those things you know how did you go about it how did you try and achieve it what obstacles did you face what successes did you have okay um i mean firstly going back to something that you said at the at, at the beginning of the of the question i do think it's really important that you've got a general secretary um who supports the leader of the labor party mm. because the lead the leader of the labor party is elected and it's really important that effectively his or her civil service which is what the staff and the general secretary are of the party that they deliver that vision it's, it's you know like having civil service delivering for the, for the government in many ways so I, I think that was really important and that was something that i was very committed to do um i'm not going to talk too much about the difficulties that they were encountered but there were some cultural difficulties i have to say and it was clear that there were some people working in the party who didn't have the same view and the same vision that that jeremy had um and i think perhaps were a little maybe threatened by that i'm not quite sure why but you know that's that's uh, that's just life in politics i mean i, I um I, I think people obviously enter politics because they've got some very strong and clear views and you're not going to shed them necessarily if you're working um full time for in a within a political organization but i think it is really important that you do make sure that you do everything in your power to try and deliver what the leader of the party wants. Obviously, it was quite difficult um, for the two years that I was in office, not least because I was ill for most of one of those years. Um, but, obviously, but clearly there was the anti-Semitism issue, which just dominated everything. Mm. Um, it was 
in the media, it seemed like constantly all the time. It was the stick that was used to, to beat Jeremy with at every possible opportunity. And it, although we did spend a huge amount of time, effort, money, resources in terms of staff and so on in tackling it, um, it was never enough for some people. Although interestingly, the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission report did acknowledge that there'd been a lot of progress from 2018 onwards in, in trying to deal with things. Although I, I'm the first to admit, you know, it's far from perfect and I'm sure that there's, there's much more that we could have done, but it tended to drown out a lot of the other stuff that was that was going on. And, and I, I'm glad you make reference to other racism because I think there is a, a number of people who are, are quite concerned that other forms of racism um, were sort of somehow relegated to, to low, lower down the, 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 the pile, if you like, of, of importance and that there was a, a hierarchy of racism because clearly, you know, Islamophobia and anti-black racism is um, very, very, very far from resolved and, and quite the opposite. You know, we're seeing the, the rise um, across Europe and across the world, but also in the UK of the far right. Mm. Um, and... When you've got an organisation that's as large as the Labour Party, which is huge, it's going to reflect in some way society. So although you would hope the majority of people would share the same values of the, you know, of, that the party espouses and, and so on, you are bound to have some people within the party who don't share those values and don't share all of them and who be, behave badly. But when you come on to talk about, um, you, you made the points that I made about women, I think it's really important that you, if you are a woman in a, in a position that's prominent, that you use that platform to try and encourage other women to break through and that you try and do things to make things more accessible. So for example, when I was um, political director in Unite, mm. we ran um, education courses specifically for members from black and Asian minority ethnic um, communities and also for women um, who wanted to become elected representatives predominantly MPs, but, you know, also um, to become councillors. So they had their own space in which to, you know, sort of develop their skills and talents and so on. Yeah. And so that they would come forward from that. And I think if you, we were, we were, we've been very successful in doing that. And, you know, although obviously the 2019 election result was devastating for all of us, there was one silver lining in that there are now more women and um, black Asian minority, minority ethnic MPs in the Labour Party than there have ever been before, which is a real positive because they in turn are role models as well mm -hmm. for other people coming through. But there's so much more we need to do. Yeah, it, it was a surprise to me. Um, and this is coming in sort of with, with naivety really of a hope in one sense, which is as, as Ty went on to discover there were such issues in the party. And when we say the party, I mean, it's difficult really. It's something that you don't really get to hear about is, A, nobody gives you an introduction to the rule book. You know, if you know the rule book, you've got power um, and how to use it and what, you know, what to do in certain uh, control meetings or whatever it is, you know, it, it's there to be used and, you know, it's fair enough. But as lay members, it's very difficult to have that, that in-depth knowledge because um, it, 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 it's unwieldy. Um, and also, it's, you know, it's a very difficult read, <laughs> you know, to know what it think, things like that mean. But you don't get an education in the rule book. The other thing is, which is difficult as, as, as a new member coming in, I find, is when we say the Labour Party, we seem to talk about a brand. And I, and I hate that, obviously, you know, late Labour is not a brand, it's a movement, all, all of that. But in the public consciousness, there is a brand to it. It carries weight, it carries a uh, provenance. But when you get closer to the party, you get to realize there are many Labour parties. You know, we have constituency Labour parties, we have executives, we have, you know, um, local government forums, whatever, you know, get close to, and you start realizing there's different structures here that you don't normally see as members of the public. Um, yeah. I wonder, would you, do you think it would help to show more of that to the public? To say, look, when you, this is what the Labour Party means at all these various structures, say, look, this is what, transparency means that people are aware that when you join these are the structures that you, that yeah it's not one, one CLP is not always represented the whole whole party really obviously there is that one in many what, what do you think about that that, that kind of relationship because you're managing different part, many parties as a, as a general secretary not just one well I mean you're absolutely right and that was one of the things I guess that the democracy review was was trying to address um, which was you know a, a key part of Jeremy's leadership um so that 
ordinary members had far more say in how the party was run, but also to, to sort of join the dots, if you like. So, for example, um, you have constituency Labour parties and you have Labour groups in councils. And although in theory they're sort of linked to each other, Labour groups are often very, very proud of their independence from the constituency Labour parties, whereas a lot of the members on the ground, who are the ones who go out and do the work to get councils elected, feel quite rightly, in my view, that there should be a far greater connection and a far greater accountability, because I don't think it's good enough to say that once you're elected, um, you're accountable to your constituents. I think that's a bit of a cop out because okay. of course you're accountable to your constituents. If you're not, then they're not going to vote you in next time. But, you know, do you not have any accountability to the people who go out on the doorstep day in, day out, you know, rain, snow, shine, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the things that is a real tension and will, you know, perhaps continue to be a tension. And that's why there's so much um, discussion and excitement about the question of open selections. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, some people who have been elected as MPs fear that because they think of a certain faction that they don't support has got the control in their constituency Labour Party, then they won't be reselected. Mm. Um, my own view of that is that's actually quite simplistic because there are a lot of people um, who, if we, I, I hate labels, but if you use the labels left and right, there are a whole number of, of people who were elected by constituencies that when they, you know, had the explosion of membership became fairly left and the left was in control mm -hmm. and you couldn't necessarily have described the MP as being on the left, but because they were hardworking, they communicated well, had dialogue with the, the members in that CLP, then they would be reselected. There wouldn't be any issue about it. I think it's only where there are people who just sort of turn their back on, on that and start, you know, thinking that they are more important than the members and they've almost got a divine right to, to be there forever, mm. that you have these tensions. And, and I think sometimes, you know, some, some elected officials are quite disparaging about ordinary members and very dismissive. Um, and they behave in certain ways that if ordinary members mm. behaved in that way, they would be calling for them to be disciplined or expelled. Mm. Um, but they, they're somehow immune from that and I, I, that's something that the democracy review was trying to address and it's certainly something that I, I felt very strongly um, was important for us to push through as well. This is this is a problem for me because in the sense you've, you've, you've highlighted something that I've always been sort of struggling with over the last year or so which is that when you mentioned the Labour group and the CLP and, and these lines of, and fair enough if that's what it is that's what it is but if you don't know that then you start interacting and you start clashing or you start miscommunicating and you wonder what's gone wrong, you know, we're, 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 because you've crossed a power line, as it were, literally in one sense, which is you put your hands on, on a line of power and you shouldn't have done in one sense. How, how we never find that out until you interact with people, you know, mm -hmm. this, these, these levels of power, these levels of privilege, if I want to have a better word, um, what can be done? Was, was that part of the democracy review to try and address those um issues really I'm yeah, so it, it, it was certainly part of that um you know to make it a more um representative organization to um make it more dem democratic um but also i think i, I just want to say this you know although I've, I've said what i've said about the differences sometimes between elected representatives you know at whatever level that they're elected and ordinary members there are an awful lot of elected not a huge number, but there are a number of elected representatives who are not like that at all. And that's what that's when you come back to Jeremy, yes. that Jeremy never, I've never been to a CLP, but I'm, I'd be prepared to bet, um, you know, everything I've got in the bank, that if Jeremy went into his constituency Labour Party, he wouldn't be, oh, I'm very important, you've all got to put me on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. He's not like that. He'd be much more interested in listening to what other people have got to say. And I think that there, there are councillors, there are, you know, County councillors, I'm, I'm sure police and crime commissioners, MPs who are like that, who are genuine, real people, per, um, you know, they, they really want to engage and listen to and learn from other people. But unfortunately, I think politics does sometimes make people very power hungry and want to cling on to that power. And I remember once I met a, a brand new MP in Westminster when I was political director in Unite. And this person was was 
fairly high and mighty with me and had never been like that before. It was extraordinary. I was really taken aback and I was saying to someone who's a member of staff afterwards, I was really surprised by that. Mm. And they said sometimes when people sort of walk into, part, into Westminster, it does something to them. It sort of messes with their head because they're, um, you know, made to feel that they're slightly more important than everyone else is. And I think that's, that's what's so important about socialism. It's about realising that nobody is better than anyone else. And we all contribute equally to society, you know, whether we're a, a, a professor, whether we're a, a, a magnet of some kind in a major multinational company, or whether we're someone who's a, a, a cleaner in a hospital, Absolutely. who of course are vitally important and hospitals can't function without them. So, you know, I, I think it's that recognizing that everyone has got a part to play, but also creating as many opportunities as you possibly can for other people and not to sort of draw, draw the ladder up after you. Now that's powerful. And my previous good ally with Laura Daly said exactly that, uh, that no one's more important than somebody else. And, and she's a local actress, yeah. not heard of her. Um, but yeah, she's she shined exactly with what you said. We're coming to the end of our, our, our time here. I'm conscious of that. Um, I wanted to leave the last word with you in, in, in terms of what hope do you see going forward? And if you, you wanted to share any, any, any writing, sometimes people do that, or any, any, anything that gives you inspiration, or, you know, just, just to end, on a positive, I, I know things are difficult. We're still in a pandemic um, and, and lo lots of problems are happening. We haven't even touched upon um, people who are, on, are, are in dispute right now and what they're struggling with. So I apologize for that. Um, but uh, yeah, over, over to you, Jenny, if you want to conclude our dialogue with, with uh, how you see the future and where, where you find hope. Well, I think there's always hope. And I think we've, we've always got to to have hope because without hope we're nothing are we and that's a that's a very easy thing to say and it's very difficult to to deliver particularly at a time when so many people are feeling increasingly isolated because of the the, the lockdown and, and people haven't really sort of seen each other and although i know pubs are open now yeah well they're, they're open if you want to go and shiver in the cold and the rain um, and talk to people and it's not it's not the same as you know being able to fully participate in in society and a lot of people particularly young people who live on their own and maybe in you know really awful substandard accommodation are feeling very very isolated so mm -hmm. i think it's really really important that we do give people not false hope but you know real belief that they can make a difference and they can change things and i think you just have to look at the struggles that are going on around us to to have hope first of all that people have got enough hope to struggle collectively. And, and that's why I've always been rooted in my trade union because that's something that I really believe in so strongly. It's, it's, it's who I am, I'm, I'm a trade unionist. That doesn't just mean I'm a member of a trade union, I work for one. Mm -hmm. It means I believe in the power of collective endeavor um, to make a difference and to change. And um, if you look at, for example, um, I mean, we've just had a, a, a strike in Leicester um, at a company called SPS Technologies and the workers there were having their terms conditions attacked and they fought back and they went on strike and they had a really strong campaign and they've won um, and you know they've, they've they've managed to win through their collective endeavor which i think is absolutely brilliant and outside the trade union one of the things that that um, jeremy introduced was community organizers and community organizers really engaged um, with people in their local communities listened to what their issues were and then campaigned around those rather than saying, here you are, here's a campaign which we think in our great wisdom is the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. They did the opposite. They listened to what people thought was important and they went and campaigned on that. Um, and I, I think that's really important. If I can, can tell you, I'll just tell you a really short story, yes. if I can, about why it's so important to listen to other people um, because otherwise you're not gonna engage and bring them on board. When I was, um, an officer many, many years ago, we had some training on organizing. And we were told about two factories that, worked with us that, that were part of the same company. One was organized within a trade union and one wasn't. And the one that was organized in a trade union, they were paid, I think, two pounds an hour more than the others. And so some organizers went to the first factory and they were saying, right, okay, come and join the union, we'll get you the two pounds more. Um, and they didn't get very much take up and they were you know, a bit surprised because who wouldn't want two pounds more? And look, if they're in a union, they've got it, you'd think that would be automatic. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, really listening and talking to people, they realised it was that the reason that they weren't getting much engagement is people just didn't believe they could achieve that. But what they said was the issue for them was portion sizes in the canteen. Um, so they started a big, because they had very small portion sizes with quite a lot of money, so they started a big campaign around that. 
about changing the portion size in the canteen and they won it. And that gave them the confidence working together collectively that then they could they could get organized and they could go ahead and campaign for the for the higher wages which is exactly what they did and i think that's really really important because you can't give people hope by making false promises you've got to bring them along a journey with you mm -hmm. and get them to really believe and understand that you know what if i stand alongside my colleagues and comrades and friends i can make a difference because we can speak as one voice and you know that is hugely powerful it's massively powerful and you know I, I don't think that there are any groups of people who can't do that if you if you believe in it mm. and the reason that we've got you know the selfish ideology of the, of the tory party in you know in in such a strong position at the moment is because it is you know people haven't had the opportunity i guess to hear that message loudly enough so we've just got to continue finding more and different ways of reaching them. We know we're not going to meet, reach them through the media. That's why alternative media sources are so important. Absolutely. Um, you know, because we saw what the media did to Jeremy, a, a good and decent man, was um, his reputation was destroyed. He wasn't destroyed because he's always got hope and he's always got positivity. Mm. Um, and I think that's something for all of us to learn, really. And just never stop reaching out, never stop speaking to people, never stop communicating. I think that's just really important. And one, one of the things you did ask me about um, a poem that, or, or anything like that, that I, I that might, you know, um, inspire me. Yeah. Um, but it's actually it's actually a song, um, and that the, one of the songs that inspires me. In fact, I always used to sing it when I was walking up the escalators in in London. Was "Bread and Roses," because I think that's absolutely beautiful, and it talk, you know, it, it talks about you know how you've got the hard grind of, of working the mill in the factory, but actually, you know, we need we need bread to feed our bodies, but we need roses to feed our souls. And I thought beautiful. That's, that's something I think is a beautiful song. Absolutely. I'm going to go and listen to it after, after our dialogue here. Oh, do, um, please, yeah. Thank you so, so much. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to keep talking to you, but uh, maybe we can do it again. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But the wonders of technology allows us to do this. I'm so grateful to you. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the stream thank now. You. No, thank you. Okay.